U.S. security officials have been on alert since the moment it started to look like Russia would invade Ukraine, warning U.S. companies and citizens alike of potential cyber attacks. But yesterday, they kicked things up a notch, with multiple agencies issuing a joint alert about a suite of malicious cyber tools capable of sabotaging the energy sector and other critical industries. My next guest has been preparing U.S. agencies for threats like these for decades and preparing them for how to respond should they occur anyway, from working in Homeland Security during the Obama administration to a role as former Governor Deval Patrick's security advisor, Juliette Kayyem has laid the groundwork for how to deal with disasters, both natural and man-made. She has a new book out on the subject, and I think Governor Charlie Baker probably summed it up best when he joined us on Boston Public Radio recently to interview Juliette about it. The devil never sleeps. If you read this book, you will never sleep. <laughs> And indeed, I have not. The author, Juliet Kayyem, that's not true, joins me now. She's a professor of international security at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, CNN commentator, and of course, a longtime regular on Boston Public Radio. Juliet, congratulations. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. What's the devil that's never sleeping? Yeah. The devil can be anything. So the purpose of the book was to say, uh, look, the harms that we face from a cyber attack to obviously a pandemic, terrorism, as we uh, are all too familiar with, to natural disasters, uh, are, are threats and risks that are ongoing just because of globalization, our connectivity. So what I wanted to do with the book is to lay a a, a framework for thinking about disaster management and thinking about success in disaster management. Uh, so to sum it up quickly, I, I want to teach people how uh, to, uh, to learn to fail safer. In other words, to expect something bad to happen and to measure success by whether we limit the harm, limit the damage, obviously limit the deaths, and return back to normal. Uh, and, and to get, and, and what are the tools to do that is an important, uh, uh, important advice to give to the American public, to give to leaders, CEOs, uh, and government leaders. You know, we're just a couple of days away from the marathon and everybody yeah. watching remembers in painful detail what happened in 2013. And while obviously there was the horror of the three people who died on the course and other after, uh, uh, the amazing part to me, and I think virtually everybody, was of the 100 plus injured, some in very serious fashion, none of them, none of them died. Is that right. not an example of exactly what you're talking about? That's exactly right. So we are, we're simple people in disaster management. We divide the world into, into, into two time zones. One is uh, uh, left of boom, we call it, which is all the prevention and all the, all the things, intelligence that go into trying to stop a bad thing from happening. The boom is could be anything, uh, including two brothers at the finish line right. at the Boston Marathon. And the right is how we respond. And I want people to think about uh, uh, sort of a less bad standard. And, and Boston Marathon is in my book because while the tragedy at the marathon, of course, is that three people uh, were killed immediately looking looking back at it for many years. Uh, the amazing thing is because of the efforts and preparedness and response to the boom, uh, we were able to limit the damage. And that included not just the training, but the ability to pivot, the communication plan, family re reunification. So that just like what you said, Jim, uh, if you made it to a hospital, you survive. Yeah. These are numbers that we generally don't see in most disasters. And that goes to that, you know, people think Boston Strong is an attitude. No, Boston Strong was investments in the kind of expectation of, of something bad happening and all the preparation that went into it. You know, you have uh, uh, virtually every page is another great example, some of which we're familiar with, some of which we won't be familiar with. I was half familiar with the the retelling that was most dramatic to me. When you compare one nuclear facility in yeah. Japan with another similarly situated nuclear facility that I'd never heard of, tell the story oh, if you would, Julia. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I appreciate that. And, and, and uh, what the stories I tell in the book, I should say, 
are are meant to be not not scary like governor baker said almost they are some of them are scary uh, but also to to get people to relate to disasters in a way that they could understand so i just basically tell a lot of stories uh from from the trojan horse to to <laughs> get all the way to surfside and uh fukushima of course was the nuclear facility that uh impacted by an, er- an earthquake in the ocean a tsunami coming off into the japanese coastline and fukushima is uh, a nuclear facility does not react in time does not has not prepared to fail safer has ignored warning signs from the past uh, stones that sit above it on, on the cliffs above where it was uh, built that say do not bu- uh, build below this line but I more importantly yeah more importantly you know a, a society that had convinced itself uh, that nuclear energy was perfectly safe and part of that is the history of, of their uh, of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the attacks, the mm-hmm. nuclear attacks on Japan, go down the block a couple miles. And this is a story you don't hear. There's a different facility, Onagawa, where people are trained to fail safer. In other words, they're going to measure success, not in whether everything goes well, right? Because that can, that can't possibly be true in all cases, uh, but, but whether they can respond and fail in a way that minimizes the harm. That nuclear facility had, had damage from the earthquake, got lost. Lots of water from the tsunami, but did not have a radiation leak. So I, I the reader will will be steered towards the other story uh, rather than thinking Fukushima represents all nuclear energy, right? It doesn't. We can build nuclear facilities, for example, uh, safer. Uh, and safely, I don't use the word safe because mm-hmm. we obviously live in a high risk society. You know, uh, when you and Governor were having uh, the Governor were having a conversation on our show, it, it's clear that it's not just strategy and preparation. It's also their political considerations. Yeah. And he talked about spending more than a hundred million dollars almost right away when he took office after the right. blizzard of 2015 and the disasters that came with it for people. And after he told that story, you brought up something called the preparedness. Mm-hmm. Paradox. Explain what that is, Julia. Yeah. So we're cha- we're challenged politically uh, by by the preparedness uh, paradox. The pra- preparedness paradox is essentially the more investment you make in 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 the moment of the boom, right, and getting ready for it. That I, I, I throughout the book I talk about. You are here now, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is the moment. Uh, that uh, the more investments you make in it, the better you do when the devil does come, whatever it can be. And then people will wonder, well, why did we invest so much in that concern? Because nothing really bad happened. The best example of that, of course, is Y2K, when billions of dollars were mm-hmm. spent to get our, our computers upgraded, uh, prepared for the number 2000. Uh, 2000 comes along uh, uh, and not much bad happened. And people look back at that and go, everyone overreacted. Nope. It was that everyone invested in that the boom that the boom could come, and what were we going to do to be able to to get through that process? So the only res- the political response to the preparedness paradox is to not view disasters as random and rare. They are now standard operating procedure, and that the investments we make in in perpetual preparedness uh, are investments in today. They are not investments in some you know resilient world of unicorns and rainbows in the future. And if people can begin to see that, though, there's a lot we can do today right I, I I want a, I want a better world in the future but that's going to come later today uh, to minimize the harm that we that we are not going to be able to stop a hundred percent of the time so it's it's a realistic book but one that I hope gives people agency as well otherwise you're going to feel frustrated and and paralyzed all the time and the people you give agency to it should be clear it's not just CEOs and no. elected leaders you you I think use the phrase all of us are crisis managers no. and that includes the man or woman woman running his or her home and their family, all of these lessons apply to them as well, yes? That's exactly right. So, uh, you know, from the highest level CEOs uh, to the uh, to the parent and the family members. I mean, obviously, after the pandemic, we certainly know this to be true. Uh, but I, what I wanted to to do with the book, or what I did with the book, is say, look, everything, you know, all these different harms can occur. The causes are often different, right? L- look at the subway attack this week in New York. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, who is that? What's his motivation? In some ways, it's irrelevant because from sending 
centuries of of disasters I that I that I that I write about and draw lessons from, you essentially can do this in eight easy steps, right? And they involve communication and fail-safe systems and 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 things that you could do from the home level to the to the CEO to the to the government level. And so I want to make it in, in a weird way, I want to make disaster management user friendly. I want to make it accessible because our investments, personal, institutional, government-wise, will limit the harms. And that's how we often have to measure success. I, I say, you know, well, we're going to hit a million dead with COVID. Um, and it's sort of a shocking number to say it here in the, here in the United States alone, relatively soon. And no one, look, we had a pandemic, people were going to die. And the measure of success is could we have done that with fewer deaths? I think everyone believes that that is true, right? That is gonna be how we look back is the lives that could have been saved with more aggressive preparedness. And of course, uh, a, a vaccination program that wasn't sort of fought uh, along the way. You know, we gotta go, but I think we're all lucky that you grew up as an earthquake kid in California. Yes. <laughs> Got you where you are today. Julia Kayyem, right. terrific book. Thanks so much for your time, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. The book again is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters.